my name is Tamiko Seal, and I am now a media artist, but back in 1983 to uh, 1985, I was the lead designer on the team that did the product design for the connection machines CM1 and CM2 supercomputers. If we start with the uh, connection machine specifically and how you got involved in that, um, I mean, I know you, I know a bit about your background and what you studied in, but it, it's kind of uh, pretty much ahead of your time. If, if you're at the cutting edge of technology uh, and art, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did not study uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the way I got involved in the in um, in the connection machine was simply that um, when I was a graduate student at MIT in the early 80s, 81 to 83, one of my primary social groups was the MIT AI lab. Um, I was actually studying in the mechanical engineering department, but... Um, as I always say, the AI lab parties were more fun. Actually, I don't think I ever went to an ME party. but um, um, And I got hooked up with the MIT AI lab people because when I was in uh, uh, when I was working at Hewlett Packard as a product designer in Silicon Valley in uh, 79, 80, um, my boyfriend at the time, Gene McDaniel, was at um, Xerox Park. So I knew, you know, I was in their social circles and in their wine tasting circles. And when um, when they found out I was going to MIT for grad school, they said, "Oh, you should like get to know my friend Danny Hillis and Marvin Minsky over at the MIT AI lab." So so I landed in 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 Boston with uh, recommendations to look them up, and um, somehow I just struck up an immediate friendship with Danny and and. And like I said, <laughs> went to a lot of parties, um, and you know, some of them in in the basement of Marvin's uh, big house, which is where Danny Hillis was living with uh, uh, with Margaret Minsky, Marvin's daughter. They were together at that time, living together in the basement. So you know, so I I hung out there, and um, and uh, when I graduated, uh, like three days after the graduation ceremony. In June of 1983, all of a sudden, Danny called me up and said, you know, uh, I'm starting a company to actually build the machine that I'm designing for my doctoral thesis. And um, since I know that you worked as a product design engineer um, uh, at, at Hewlett Packard, uh, I'm wondering if you'd um, come to the, join the company. I was employee number 10. And um, and uh, do the product design. So he uh, he took me out to the um, to the Robert Treat Payne House that uh, they had just rented over in Waltham, where they were putting in they were recabling the whole house because this is like a uh, like a 19th century building that was going to have massive power going in and out for all of the um, all of the list machines. You know, each one of the software. People and probably the hardware people also was working on a workstation, so uh, they had to literally rewire the entire house. And in the hot summers, we kept on taking down the the power net in the area. <laughs> so Danny took me out and showed me the uh, the house, which is on 11 acres of woods, and said, "And uh, the best thing is if you come and work for us, you get to work with Richard Feynman." And I said, "Where do I sign? Where do I sign?" So it was really that informal, and you know that's the that's the typical power of uh, going to a place like MIT, where you know the the people you just hang out with uh, um, do really interesting things. That is actually really amazing. I didn't know the details of that. Um, but before you got to MIT, you were studying industrial design. I guess, or oh, industrial product design, design, actually, because industrial design, at least then, I think the categories have shifted somewhat, but industrial design back in those days was essentially, um, uh, was much more, was essentially the aesthetics and, and the look of, of, uh, of, of products and product design back in those days. I, I, I was at the Stanford product design program, and back in those days, um, the, uh, it was a joint program with uh, between the 
sort of art design and mechanical engineering departments and and I was just like two um uh, two classes short of also getting a um uh an an m e degree um and I was more focused on sort of human factors and um sort of the mechanical side of things so which which back in those days at least was very different from the focus on aesthetics um and 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 form that um uh, was industrial design so when you're at m i t um working on your master's degree or and you have access to the a i lab I, I mean, not in a not in a technical sense. I I literally just hung out at their parties. Oh, I really just, <laughs> just socially. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was a but, social groupie. Oh, I see. I see. I would think that things that were happening in the AI lab. I mean, they've already built up a reputation uh, going back a couple of decades at that point. Um, in the in the late seventies, early eighties, it's almost that you know two decades of AI lab and the mm-hmm. tech model yeah. railroad and all that stuff. Um, right. Did you get to use any of the the uh, computers or the like the ITS operating system that they were working on? Um, no, um, I was you know I was also not uh, so much of a programmer. I mean, it turns out that my master's project in the uh, ME department's um, biomechanical lab was uh, uh, a programming project, but. But you know, I took like one Pascal class and then one assembly class, and then um, you know, when I was a freshman uh, at Stanford, um, my freshman advisor was a physicist at Slack, so he gave me a summer job there, and and then handed me a reference Fortran reference book and said, "Here, learn how to program." And my first question was, "What is a program?" Um, so. <laughs> So you know, I I I did not study computer science. I sort of picked up some programming, kind of, uh, uh, because you know every engineering student has to. But um, when I was hanging out at Xerox Park, they had the Altos, they had uh, Windows, and the mouse at a point when no one else had it. But um, but I also didn't have access there because my uh, my, my my boyfriend would always go. We have the mouse in Windows, and you don't get to use it. You know, so it's like, you know, I I read I read uh, I read stories where other artists said, you know, uh, uh, you know, they were sneaking me in uh, nights and weekends so I could play around on their altos, and and you know, my direct contact was was telling me I couldn't. <laughs> so it's like, so so you know, another friend of mine was on um, back in in those days was Joanna Hoffman on the first Macintosh team. Um, she couldn't tell us uh, that she was working on the Macintosh because it was a secret project at that time, and she actually only told me in hushed tones when she came out to visit me in I think eighty two uh, at, at MIT. Um, but uh, but you know of course you know I was hanging out with these people and with the people who designed the the Ethernet and and um, and so everyone's like talking about um, computers and then you know when I go and hang out at uh, the MIT AI lab people are also talking about computers so so basically although I didn't have any background in programming um, uh, I had, because of my social groups in both Silicon Valley and at MIT, I had been essentially in these, in these, uh, uh, you know, hanging out with these uh, research, computer research groups at Xerox Park, Apple, uh, MIT AI Lab from 79 until uh, Danny asked me to join the company that he had just started in 83. So, you know, and, and, and I must say taking an assembler class was really key because you know you're sitting there saying okay you know shift to register right um, and you're dealing with uh, binary and and the uh, that one uh, assembler class that I took um, gave me enough background so when I was at uh, uh, thinking machines and people were talking about you know the ALU and shift registers and stuff like that um, you know I I knew. Not only sort of conceptually, but I had also, you know, I had worked with those sorts of things. So, so I, I, I had personal experience with that really low level of, of computer architecture, even though 
you know, I didn't actually use it in my I, my work per se. Yeah, I, I can imagine just you know just being around it. Uh, human beings are clever, and we pick up on things, and we recognize patterns. And sooner or later, it's gonna, you know through osmosis, <laughs> you're going to be <laughs> you know one of the clubs, so to speak. Um, but yeah. that is just mm-hmm. so amazing to have to be so close in those years to uh, what was going on at Stanford and uh, Xerox Park, and then at MIT. Um, there, it's just uh, even even just as a user, not necessarily a programmer. There was um, some interesting things and in concepts um, like email and uh, even oh yeah yeah what people would consider in, you know the birth of instant messaging. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got my first email in 1979 while I was still in the um, uh, in the Bay Area because. Because, because like everybody I knew had email. I mean, they're you know everyone at at Park or whatever had email. I actually didn't have email at at uh, Hewlett Packard. But then I think a friend of mine at at Park said, "Oh, you know, I can get you an account through MIT because they have these like ghost accounts that they they set up." So, so, um, so you know, I was on email from '79, and when I you know when I first arrived. At MIT, I'm I'm looking for a terminal, and we we are talking about selectric terminals. We are not talking about CRTs. Uh, a terminal where I could read my email. I'm sitting there, and, and I finally found one somewhere in the in the comp side building. And um, I'm sitting there reading my email, and there's this guy uh, uh, sitting not far away who's kind of like keeps on looking at me. And finally, like he gets up all of his courage and he says, "Wow, you're a girl." I go, yeah. And, wow, you're reading your email. And I go, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> the next line was something like, and, wow, you don't shave your legs. And I'm going like, I think this guy's trying to pick me up. <laughs> but it was but it was an unusual thing for anyone to be reading email, and it was uh, an unusual thing for a girl to be reading email at that point also. So, so yeah, it was... Uh, it, it, I didn't plan it that way at all. It sort of slipped into things, but um, it, it was a really interesting, uh, circuitous thing. On the other hand, you know, I was surrounded by all of these people doing really interesting things, and I wanted to be part of that sort of atmosphere, but nothing that they were doing interested me. Like all the people at Xerox Park are working on documents, and it's like, I'm not interested in documents. Um, so... <laughs> um, so it was really, you know, and and you know, at MIT at comp side departments, they're usually talking about, you know, processor design, and I wasn't interested in processor design either. What did interest me was when Danny said, you know, we're we're doing this supercomputer, and uh, it's going to cost at least a million dollars. Um, so you know, just don't even think about how much the packaging costs; just make it look drop dead incredible. So as a as a as a 25 year old product designer, um, you know I got like <laughs> I got carte blanche to um, to do the most incredible packaging design I could think of. So um, that maybe also led to my decision a couple of years later when I knew the design was fixed and wouldn't change to say, okay, um, I've kind of achieved the height of what I can achieve in this area let's go off and do something completely different than i went to art school i got gotcha. you oh wow um yeah i mean the the cm1 is is just a, a, a striking design i've heard you describe it as being you know uh, a certain height it didn't have to so it wouldn't be imposing it, it's friendly in a in an interesting way because <laughs> it's unlike any other computer um, and it's and, but and we know technically it's not a computer. It's just a bunch of um, it's a bunch of single bit processors. It's, it's extended memory. In a way. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Extended it's, intelligent memory. Yeah, but that was also really a design criteria from Danny. He said, make it. You know, it should be like your height or so, because then uh, because then it'll you know for your generic white American male it'll be slightly below eye height, and so. You know, we don't want to. Of course, we we all had uh, things like HAL and 2001 in our um, 
a space odyssey in our heads and, um, you know, building the first commercial AI uh, supercomputer, Danny didn't want to have it be sort of the dreaded uh, technical overlord that was the uh, the standard trope of science fiction. So, so that was really a really conscious decision on Danny's part to make it seem like it's you know a member of the family, a machine that can be proud of us. And I cannot think of computers before it or after that have that you know that many LEDs that are doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so. How much, but, but of, you, you, how much you do of know that, that is... Oh, well, just a second. You do know that the the LEDs are actually the status lamps for each processor chip. Right. Uh, right. So, so they're not... I mean, that's something that was lost in the CM5, which uh, the follow-on machine that I did not work on, except for <laughs> except for a, a 99th hour consulting Um but uh, there, it was literally, the LEDs were literally an add-on decorative panel to maintain that look. Again, that's sort of an industrial design thing, um, whereas it was really important to me on the, on the CM1, CM2, that it was not a decorative add-on. It was really letting, you know, we made the doors transparent so you could see the light inside the machine. And I would have done that if they had, you know, if they had hired me back to do the, the CM2, I would have done a similar thing in probably a rather different way on the on the CM5 to let the the life of the machine show through to communicate that life to the people standing around. You know, even then, um, people talk about at least uh, people operators of of mainframes with that would have. Not necessarily this scale of of lamps, but you know something like a PDP10 or a KI10 uh-huh. would have right. a bunch of lamps, and it's not that you're looking at exactly what those lamps are doing, but the sequence of patterns that you see, and you can, when you look at one of one of those machines, you see certain patterns, and you kind of know what state it's in, and what it's doing, and when it's hung, and when it's in a loop, and um, right. It's not running at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, um, yeah. so that carries into it, but gosh, uh, it's a futuristic representation for sure, and it and it's done in a different way. But it's um, it's then it's kind of like the last flourish of blinking lights, I would say, because <laughs> yeah. like you said in the CM5, the way they did it was just it was Hollywood, so to speak. And guess what? That's the one that made it into Jurassic Park, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it was uh, it was also very big. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how tall each unit of the CM5 is, but um, but there um, uh, there they uh, uh, they just they had to you know throw out the idea of keeping it small because it was just. Uh, it was just too big. I mean, it, it turns out, you know, at some point, my my, uh, my first job at uh, Thinking Machines was, is it even physically possible to build this? And so, like, you know, I went through all the details and and uh, and said, you know, well, it's going to be it's going to be t- ten foot tall, you know, with the specs that you gave me for how <laughs> big the board has to be and stuff. It's going to be ten foot tall, and it's and and there's there's actually some material on my website um, showing those designs where it has really convoluted um, uh, wiring, cabling. And so after I said that, they came back and said, well, I guess we're going to have to get, get inventive. And they reduced the number of, uh, of, of, uh, of cables coming off the board uh, drastically. I can't remember now exactly what they did, but I think it was something about ganging up the power maybe distributing the power differently. And um, and then at that point, uh, um, it became clear that we could actually put the machine in a 19-inch rack. So it could really be just like a normal computer, a normal washing, you know, refrigerator or, or whatever. So at that point, there was no... There was, uh, you know, you can say after that point, it was a marketing decision to go with a 
a package that was different and somehow expressed the essence of the machine. But it was it was a really important marketing decision because because we were all like you know twenty five twenty six year olds. And there were a couple of adults, as we called them, who were you know taking care of the finances and stuff. Um, or the head of engineering was was an adult. He was probably forty. But um, but you know, Danny was, and I were like twenty five, twenty six, and many of the engineers, like uh, like Brewster Kale, um, you might know him from the Internet Archive, yeah. but he did the VLSI design of the first um, connection machine chip, and um, and he he had just graduated uh, with his uh, with his master's, I think. I mean, he was like twenty two or something like that, twenty one, twenty two. So um you know so so here we were this bunch of kids and and you know IBM and of course Cray and uh DEC and all these other and Fujitsu all these other um companies you know were being run by adults and they were kind of like why would you want to buy you know a computer built by a bunch of kids you know from a, from a company that hasn't existed before so so um, it was very, very important that as soon as the people saw the machine, they they grokked it, they grasped the concept. Uh, you didn't have to like explain to them because they just looked at the machine, and you know you, you could like lead them into the room and say, "You've never seen a machine before this in your life, and it's got sixty four thousand processors all working simultaneously on the same problem." And then you lead them into the room, and then you know it's 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 kind of dark and all these machines are hunting away and in the middle of the room because it, you can't back it up against the wall <laughs> is this big black electronic brain blinking away and humming away. And people just go, I get it. I get it. You're right. I've never seen a machine like this in my life. So, you know, that was, that was the, the risk that thinking machines was willing to take, which another company might not have taken. They would have said, nah, you know, it's too expensive. We'll just, like, shove it into a 19-inch rack. Um, but um, thinking machines knew they, they had to have some sort of immediate advantage when you, you know, you showed a um, potential customer the machine for the very first time. They had to be convinced from the get-go. Uh, and you're right. It, it does have to sit in the middle of the room. <laughs> you know, Cray was Cray was trying to do that, um, do that too to have sort of, but I think Cray is probably a little more imposing because there are no lights; it's just sitting there humming away. Much of the Cray computers um, and some of the the CDC stuff that Seymour did um, don't use fans, so they're you you'll hear the compressor system that's doing the cooling, you know, running the so it's a different kind of hum. But the, yeah, yeah. I know the 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 CM1 and CM2 were both um, air cooled. Yeah, both air cooled, right? right. And, this, and, and the Cray 2 was. Uh, or, yes, it's floor inert, it, so it has. Yeah. The, the Cray 2 has a has that iconic, I guess iconic, you can call it uh, a waterfall with the it just says Cray on it, that uh, <laughs> plexiglass. Uh, but uh, I mean, those are. Fairly contemporary, I'd say, the connection machine and, and the Cray. The, yeah, the, the Cray one already existed at the point uh, when when I started uh, working on the connection machine. So the Cray one was the only example that we had of a of a machine that was really striking and also whose design was really, uh, you know, was really driven by the necessity of the architecture. You know, every single wire in the cray had to be the same length because <laughs> because the speed of light was you know was would would uh cause problems the speed of light is a constant and if your wires are different lengths the speed of light is uh the amount of time it takes to get there is is different so um yeah. so that's why it had that rat's nest of, uh, of wires yeah the the point to point connections are kind of the the signature of of Seymour Cray, the, the drain right. point to point wires, because the timing is so critical. And then, right. of course, in the connection machine, you you have ribbon cables coming off the back of the the back plane. And right, and, and the 
the way that those were boxed. Um, right, and and some of those cables go, you know, really from uh, because because the package was uh, when you opened it up, essentially formed the EU. Some of those cables go from one end of the machine completely to the other, and so um, I think in I think uh, maybe in in um, in the CM2 in some uh, some versions of it that they were tr- where they were you know, trying to increase uh, running speed. Um, that did sort of become a, a block, and and so in the CM5, um, they might have gone to a very different wiring scheme. I actually don't know the wiring scheme of the CM5, but um, but you know with the with the conceptual architecture of the CM1 and CM2 and the and the 12 dimensional hypercube, um, the con- uh, you know the concept was that the that the length was not a critical factor because. Uh, because you have to, you know, you have to wait for all of the um, processors to finish their step anyway. They're all in lockstep. You just described how you open up one of these things. Um, well, not exactly how to open it up. There's kind of a secret door. <laughs> and you have to loosen the, uh, it. It's a, a couple of bolts, and then it, it, it kind of opens up into this U shape. And then there's a, a right. great picture of you. Um, you know, in the middle of the machine, so to speak. Right. Yeah, looking over the top because it's you're taller than it is now. Are you standing on your tippy toes? Or? <laughs> yeah, it's um, I, I I'm I'm only like one inch taller than it. So you know, so it's uh, my eye height is below the top of it. Um, so yeah, I have to uh, to peek over the top. I really have to get on my tippy toes. <laughs> Um, in 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 the design of it, um, how far did you get into it? I mean, aside from the you know the sliding door, the sliding plexiglass doors, or the tinted red door, are, are the doors tinted red? They are, aren't they? Um, they're actually. It, it was um, it was sort of a bronze uh, plexiglass, and then um, there's a red. Um, a red translucent uh, plastic foil on the back of each door, um, in, or, in order to um, give uh, give it a uh, a redder cast, and then also sort of let the the red of the lights show through. And those those doors, I mean, they were hand sanded. I don't we we I've never been able to find out in production how were they actually made. But I know that the prototype ones that Gordon Bruce and Al Hawthorne, the industrial designers that we hired to work with us on the machine, um, the ones that they produced uh, were literally hand sanded and then and then uh, sprayed with a I think it's a Kevlar matte spray in order to um, reduce the reflection. Um, and I swear to God, I've asked everyone I, I could find how they were made in production, and whoever knows that. I haven't found that person yet, <laughs> mm. so um, that, that's a problem when uh, you know when when the Museum of Modern Art in New York you know talk about wanting to refurbish the the doors because they're scratched. Then it's like no one knows how it was done anymore, except for this hand process, which also doesn't work because that matte spray is not made anymore. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a conservationist nightmare. So most people have said, okay, this is a real working machine. It's got scratches. Live with it, you know. Yeah. Show your wounds, as uh, as uh, Joseph Boyce, the German artist, always said. <laughs> Don't hide your wounds. Show your wounds. You can either tell if a machine's been loved or if it's been stored in a barn for a number of years. <laughs> um, yeah, and most machines at this point went through both right. phases. But um, one thing that I wanted to add that uh, kind of got shot down was I said, you know, it's not just about the blinking lamps. You've got to hear the fan as well. <laughs> yes, yes. And that actually, um, you know, because MoMA uh, uh, didn't uh, do that. You know, everyone who, who worked at, at Thinking Machines who came to the MoMA opening said, you know, what's missing? All the fans, because they were like, you know all these decks of fans, and they were like going constantly. So, so seriously, um, 
tell you know tell everyone else that you are absolutely right that the the noise of the fans is also an important part of it wouldn't there have been what is it, something like 18 fans per per quadrant uh nine on the top and nine on the bottom there might be more actually yeah there um because there's fan trays up above and below right the card uh, sets or the board and sets. i think i think i think there were two in the you know in the in the wasp waist middle i think <laughs> they were they were stacked two on top of each other below i'm not sure um I think Gordon Bruce wrote an article on those sorts of details, and I might have a copy somewhere, but I haven't digitized it yet. But I could try and find that. Um, the, uh, Ted Billado, who did the, um, the the cooling design, at least <laughs> at least in 2017, he was still alive, uh, um, but having some problems, and and he loved to talk about uh, fans, so. Uh, um, so if you guys want to talk to him, I can uh, send you his, his information. And um, he doesn't respond to email, but you can just call him, and he'll, you know, and if he's uh, he's still alive, he'll talk your ear off about fans. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> like many folks do, I know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, I, oh, I, oh, oh, hold on, just a second before I forget, um, um, because you said it was. Uh, it only had like one cube worth of boards. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, you know, basically a, a machine that was fully loaded uh, with uh, with boards and all eight uh, cubes. It was pretty expensive, and um, and they were they mostly went to the dark sites. Um, so of course they we have no uh, record of that, um, uh, but. Um, the most typical version had one tower, so two cubes um, filled with boards. And that was true okay. of the of the MoMA machine. Yeah. So you're saying the one at MoMA also was potentially fully populated? No, 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 no. It was also only one one tower, so a 16k machine. I so see. So 64k is the full machine. Uh, two uh, uh, two towers. Usually the front two towers are are the uh, it's the 32k machine. One tower is the most was the most common one sold. 16k. Um, it's a- actually a little bit rare to have an 8k machine like you had in in the large package because at some point um, a couple years later um, they hired an industrial designer to make a like a one cube knockoff, which of course had a lot cheaper package. So uh, uh, that would the- be cute. A tripping hazard, but that would be cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it was maybe not on the ground. It was maybe on a desk. But, uh, but that was called the 2A, CM2A. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really interesting because that, that particular machine, it's like there is so much open space inside of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because it, there, why... Why put the the back planes in? You know, they possibly could be field installed later if the customer wanted to upgrade. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah it, that one is mostly empty. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I think part of it was that they were hoping people would upgrade, or most people hoped that they could upgrade. Uh, whether or not that ever happened, um, and uh, it was also because of of like cooling and power uh, considerations. That, um, mm-hmm. That uh, you know, at some point they they said, okay, we're going to just ship with the with the main package. I mean, you know, it, it's there was never a uh, version that was a uh, uh, 16k machine, one tower. Um, it was always either uh, the the 8k uh, machine in the CM2A little package, or if it had more than eight, then it was always in the in the in the full uh, CM1, CM2 package. Yeah, and it, it's I, we noticed that's important because um, when when it's not when you're trying to move it and take it apart, it can it becomes a tipping hazard. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, so it really needs to be in that, that form, and then you open it as a U for maintenance. Or whatever you can do. More stable, yeah. Yeah, it is definitely much more stable. Keep keep the uh, keep it in that 
sort of opening, closing. Do, yeah. do you know how approximately how many CM1s slash CM2s were made? Um, yeah, CM, CM1s is a small ha handful. Um, I actually don't know an exact number. Um, I'm guessing maybe around 32. I've, I've sort of collated all the dimensions that I've been able to find, but you know, um, they you know they got they got like resold and uh, and the black sites black site machines were never counted anyway. And you know, Danny says they shipped the machine to to Italy and uh, and it disappeared. And they figure it probably actually was transshipped over Italy to Russia. You know, so oh <laughs> it's like oh so. God. So, so it's a it's it's a real floating number. Um, I did have uh, have a figure of a total of seventy installations worldwide, but an installation can range from you know we've got an eight K uh, CM two A to we've got a CM five and a CM two and a data vault. Um, so you know so. Uh, and and the seventy installations worldwide definitely included CM fives. Um, so. Okay. So my my best guess is somewhere around like thirty uh, CM1, CM2, and uh, CM200 that were all in the same package. Uh, I got a question for you. Were you um, were you disappointed um, when the CM5 was showed up in Jurassic Park? <laughs> nah, so uh, I mean the CM2 was pretty old at that uh, point. Um, and you know, I mean, <laughs> I understand marketing. I understand why they want to show the, the you know, the very impressive current one. Um, the CM2 was in the the Fly 2. The, the film The Fly had two, uh, two um, uh, was a series of two movies, and and um, there's images where you can see it in the uh, see it in in the the second one. Um, but you know the um, uh, the uh, Jurassic Park, the book actually talked about having a cray, and so the fact that it's a CM, it's a CM instead of a cray is actually a huge coup for a coup for uh, thinking machines. <laughs> that is, yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I mean, I, I can't describe to you what that half year was from, was like in 2016 to 2017 from, from you know, the first email of the, uh, from the MoMA curator saying, you know, we'd like to acquire one, do you know of any, to the point where the, uh, she told me, okay, it's been approved, uh, you know, I mean, it's like I had to find one, I didn't, you know, it, 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 I didn't know if I could find one that was actually for sale, and and uh, and I was I was just sweating blood for half a year because you know this was it's like this was my baby, yeah. and I've seen I've seen ones that have been trashed, you know, and it's it's and of course you know of course there's like you know there's one in the Smithsonian and and uh, there was one in the Computer History Museum, but. But you know, none of them are interested in in the in the product design of of, of the thing. Um, and I knew if I got got it into the Museum of Modern Art, it was because of the design. So that was you know specifically um, about you know my part of the connection machine. So I was sweating blood, and and you know, sure enough, like the year I turned sixty was the year that I got into the museum. So. That was amazing. It's like after that, it's like, okay, I can die happy.